All right, welcome back, folks. Today we're going to look at oligopolies. It's our introduction uh, to oligopolies, and we'll be covering them over the next couple of days. All of the uh, information that we're going to share today is in Chapter 15 of your book and the pages that are listed on the screen. And uh, our goals here are to uh, be able to identify what is an oligopoly, to be able to def define that market structure, um, and explain why oligopolies uh, benefit from this concept of collusion and discuss why they have a difficulty uh, cooperating with each other, even though uh, it's in their best interest. So let's start by defining oligopolies for a moment. We go back and we look at this chart from the book and we say that market structures that we've already covered were perfect competition um, and monopoly, where um, the products were not differentiated, but the issue was uh, there was one firm and a monopoly and many in perfect competition. But there's a, a gap between one and many, and that's where there are a few firms, and that's where we talk about oligopoly. So in this market structure, it doesn't matter whether the products are exactly the same or not. As long as you have what are defined as a few firms, then you have an oligopoly. Some examples of oligopolies uh, include uh, Pepsi versus Coke, where there are basically two major uh, producers of soft drinks in this country, and so there are a few firms in the industry, more than one, but less than many. The uh, OPEC cartel of oil producing uh, countries is an example of an oligopoly where there are a few firms, or in this case, few countries that control the oil market. Uh, wireless phone providers, there are a few, not many. Um, cable television, airlines begin to look like an oligopoly. Computer operating systems are definitely an oligopoly. Um, and we'll talk about uh, how we can identify and classify oligopolies in a minute. So what are oligopolies? In general, they are, uh, they are a market structure with a few firms that operate interdependently. That means that the decisions they make uh, are not only driven by what's best for the company as an individual, but also based on what other people in the market um, do. So the decisions of one firm affect the decisions of others. The success of one firm impacts the ability of others to be successful. And so the decisions you make um, are not only driven by what is best for your company, but what your competitors might also do. In its simplest form, we could talk about an oligopoly as a duopoly, where there are two actors. So um, more than a monopoly, where there's one, a duopoly has two firms in it, and each firm is called a duopolist. Now, in a duopoly, there tends to be a very significant incentive uh, to cheat on your partner, to try and take advantage of uh, the situation to maximize your profits at the expense of the other firm in your market. Essentially, uh, firms have an incentive to collude because it can help maximize their profits, but um, they have an incentive to cheat as well. The strongest form of collusion is what we call a cartel. That's a formal legal agreement between companies, or in, in, in the case of OPEC, between countries, uh, on how much each um, member of the cartel is responsible for producing. Turns out, though, that cartels are illegal in the United States. In fact, um, executives from major companies from the same industry, when they get together, are very careful about what they do and don't say, because if they start talking about how they could work together to maximize profits, they begin to run afoul of the law. And so a formal agreement is not legal. An informal agreement is also not legal. Uh, we expect, in this country at least, that companies will operate separately from each other. But the reality is that there are still ways in which uh, companies can work together to make things better for themselves um, through informal means. Uh, because you can't formalize an agreement, however, there is a very strong incentive for firms to cheat uh, on their, on their um, partners or competitors in the industry. And um, we'll talk about an example of why. Let's pretend for a minute that there's a, uh, a small town and there are uh, two gas stations in the town and each gas station has 50% of the market and they also face a marginal cost of $1 per 
per gallon of gasoline. So um, if we were in a perfectly competitive market, we would see uh, the price of gasoline fall to $1 because that would be uh, equal to marginal cost. And so if we had a demand schedule like this, we would see then that uh, the two firms in a perfectly competitive world would amount to uh, 1,400 uh, gallons of gas produced. But uh, because it's not a perfectly competitive market and because there are two firms in it, they could stop and say, wait, what if we acted differently? Could we increase our economic profit? Because right now at a dollar per gallon, there is no economic profit. And the answer is yes, they could decide to uh, act essentially as a monopolist to team up and reduce their output and cause prices to rise. And so we could, could look at this and we could say then that if they were to act as a monopolist, these two gas stations would uh, work together to restrict output to 800 gallons of gasoline because it's at that point that our marginal uh, revenue would be um, greater than our marginal cost. If we made 900 gallons of gasoline, our marginal revenue would actually be less than marginal cost, so that doesn't make any sense. So we, would, we could, as duopolists, work together and agree that we'll only produce 800 gallons of gasoline, 400 gallons from me, 400 from you, and we'll maximize our profits. The problem, of course, is that without some sort of legal agreement, there is an incentive there for uh, at least one, if not both, of the members of the, of the, of the, uh, of the market to cheat. Because it, it turns out that if one of the gas stations chooses to honor the agreement and only make 400 gallons of gas, and another firm decides to break that agreement and produce, say, 500 gallons of gasoline, then by cheating, they're able to maximize uh, their profit at the expense of their partner. If I decided to go ahead and, and cheat, then um, I could, if I'm the firm making 500 gallons of gasoline, then I would have 500 gallons of gasoline uh, at the price of $3.50. And if you do the math, you find that um, $500 of gasoline sold at $3.50 a gallon, uh, subtracting the $500 in marginal costs leaves me with a profit of $1,250. Um, whereas if I had, had not increased my output, I would have been selling 400 gallons of gasoline at $4 a gallon, um, minus my $400 in marginal costs, I would have only had a profit of $1,200. So there's an incentive there and an, an opportunity for one of the firms to uh, break their agreement, produce more, and make a higher profit. And because both firms know this, um, there, there is the potential that they'll both cheat uh, and end up with, with less profit than they could have had if they had honored the agreement. But once you start going down that road, of trying to take advantage of the situation at the expense of your partner, you end up uh, essentially cheating your way all the way back down to where you would have been if you were perfectly competitive. And we'll look at some examples um, in class on that so you can get a better sense of it. But how do we know that uh, there are a few firms versus uh, many? Well, one of the measures that's used is what's called the herfindahl hirschman Index. And what that index does is it takes the um, market share for each firm in the market and um, squares it, and then adds the squares of, of each of the uh, market shares to get a number. And that number, that HHI, then tells us whether we're dealing with competition or oligopoly. And so the general rule of thumb that's used is that if the HHI score is less than 1,000, then you're looking at a perfectly competitive or a very competitive uh, industry. If it's between 1,000 and 1,500, then it's what we would classify as somewhat competitive. And if it's greater than 1,500, you're looking at an oligopoly. Once you get scores of HHI of over 1,500, we're talking about an industry with only a few actors in it. So we could take a look at some examples. In the world of PC operating systems, there's basically two firms, and it has a uh, a very high HHI score, so clearly it's an oligopoly. Wide body aircraft, again, only produced really by two major firms, clearly an oligopoly. Automobiles are beginning to become somewhat more competitive because there are several firms in the market, but still um, there, is, there is not as much competition as, say, retail grocers, where there are way more firms that I've listed there, and the HHI score is very, very low. 
Um, so it should come as no surprise then that groceries are pretty much the same price across the board regardless of where you go because it's a very, very competitive market. The last thing we want to look at today is how do firms compete with each other in the world of oligopoly? Well, they have uh, two choices. One is what we call quantity competition. And that's where uh, you, you try and uh, sell more than the other guy to take advantage of um, would take advantage of the price and quantity effects. But this usually works when your output is fixed, when it's difficult to change your output once it's established. So once one firm says, this is how much I'm going to make, the other firm then has an incentive to kind of follow along. Um, and so they tend to divide up the market and say, you get 50%, I'll take 50%, and we'll go home happy. So that competition usually leads to limited opportunities um, for cheating and it ends up with a relatively high economic profit as both firms work together to act as monopolists. The alternative is what we call price competition. That's where they try and undercut each other, where they might uh, see an opportunity to uh, produce some more, uh, more of a good in order to drop the price uh, ahead of their competitors and by doing so uh, increase their, their profit. And so in these circumstances where, where firms are pr competing based on price, we see an undercutting going on, which oftentimes will lead to an outcome where price is equal to marginal cost. And we basically end up at a situation where even though we only have a few firms, the outcome is very similar to uh, perfect competition. Which one of these is more, more likely? Uh, research generally points to the fact that firms act in a price competitive situation, in part because the quantity competition, in order to know that information, uh, firms would have to be in more obvious collusion with each other. And that's usually not uh, legal and difficult to get away with. So for the most part, oligopolies will uh, compete with each other on price when they, choose to, um, when they choose to try and cheat on each other. We'll look at some more examples of oligopolies and, and work on some practice uh, problems in class. And um, make sure to fill out your response form, and we'll see you soon. Bye.